to speak on creation and evolution, and especially when I do debates, there's always somebody during Q&A time at the university that says, there are contradictions in the Bible. As a brand new Christian, age uh, 16, I went to the Methodist church camp one more time, because I'd been going to the Baptist church, but at the Methodist church camp, where I had been going before, the counselor sat us boys down on the bed and said, hey, hey guys, who are you? you know, how old are you? Where do you live? Etc. And we told him our names. We're all sitting around in the bunks there. And he said, well, my name is, whatever it was, George or something, he said, I'm a student at University of Illinois, and I want you to know I'm a humanist. Well, I didn't know what a humanist was, so I said, does that mean you believe in humans? He said, well, I do believe in humans, but no, that's not what that means. He said, uh, I said, well, do you believe the Bible? He said, well, the Bible's a good book, but it has lots of errors. Now, I had only been saved for a few months, but I was smart enough to know, because my preacher told me, if anybody ever says the Bible's full of errors, hand them your Bible and say, show me one. So I handed him my Bible and says, well, show me one. He said, I'll be glad to. Here's what he showed me. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says pretty clearly in chapter 1, The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit trees. This happened on the third day. The counselor said, Kent, when did God make the trees? I said, day 3. He said, all right. Verse 20, day 5. Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth. He said, Kent, when did God make the birds? I said, day five. He said, what did he make the birds out of? I said, well, it looks like he made them out of the water. Correct. You know, he made Adam out of the dirt, made Eve out of a rib, made the birds out of the water. That's what it says, okay? Verse 24. Let the earth bring forth the living creature. He said, now, Kent, what did God make the creatures out of? I said, he made them out of the earth, he made the birds out of the water, made the animals out of the dirt. And then he made man. He said, that's chapter 1. Now look at chapter 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the Lord God made grow every tree. He said, wait, wait, wait. I thought the trees were made on day 3, and man on day 6. Here we have the man made, and then the trees after man, which is correct. Were the trees made before man or after man? Have you ever been in an argument with somebody and you, you knew you're losing? You ever been, you get married guys know about that. You just know, you know, I'm losing this argument. Okay, you might as well stop right now, all right? You might as well just quit. Verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. Oh, here we got two problems. You got the animals made after man, and you got the birds made after man, and the birds are made out of the ground instead of out of the water. He said, Kent, the Bible's a good book, but it's got lots of contradictions. Just in the first two chapters, did the chapter 1 say the grass plants trees made on day 3? Chapter 2 has plants and trees made after man on day 6. Chapter 1 has birds made out of the water on day 5. Chapter 2 has birds made out of the ground on day 6. Chapter 1 has animals made before man. Chapter 2 has animals made after man. He said, the Bible's a good book, but it's not God's Word. I'd only been saved a couple of months, and I was crushed in my faith. It seems to happen to every young Christian. Satan sends somebody along to destroy their faith and get them derailed. Well, that caught me, I'll tell you what. The rest of that week is camp, at camp, I was a defeated young Christian. Well, I wish I could find that guy today. I can answer his question now, okay? Here's what happened. On the third day, God made the plants, okay, grass, plants, trees. On the fifth day, he made the birds out of the water. On the sixth day, he made the animals, and then he made man, and then he made the garden and put the man in the garden. Now, all of chapter 2 is describing what happened in the garden only. It's not describing the whole world. God made more trees, and it's only the two kinds, the trees that are good for food and the trees that are good to the sight. Beautiful garden. The rest of the world's already full of trees. He's describing what happened in the garden. And then he made one more of each animal so that Adam could name them and select a wife. And so while Adam's standing there, up out of the ground is coming one more of each animal. Now the rest of the world's already full of animals. This is just for Adam to see God do it and to make a wife and to create a wife, to, to select a wife. Up comes a giraffe. He says, giraffe, no thanks. You know, hippopotamus, no thanks. You know, elephant, no thanks. Hamster, no thanks. You know, one by one, Adam names all the animals and rejects them as a wife. And then the Lord says, Adam, go to sleep, son. I've got a surprise for you when you wake up. Put Adam to sleep, took one rib, and made the world's first loudspeaker. Uh, I mean, the world's first woman, okay? And uh, so this is only describing what's happening in the garden. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the sequence here, Adam actually saw God create things. 
Eve never saw that. Suppose God had made Adam last. Satan could walk in and say, Hey, Adam, how do you like this beautiful garden I made? And Adam would have doubts the rest of his life. Well, who really made this? I don't know. I trust you, God, but I don't know. He would, there's no way he could know. Now, the fact is, Eve never saw God create anything. So who did Satan go to to trick? Eve. The weaker vessel, 1 Timothy says. So, that's what happened. There are no contradictions in the Bible. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 are both fine. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Adam knew full well what he was doing. When she walked up and handed him that banana or whatever it was, say it's an apple, I don't know, we don't know, it's a fruit, okay? He said, oh, brother, Eve, you blew it. He looked at that and he knew if I don't become sin for her, God's going to have to kill her. I think Adam, knowing full well what he was doing, voluntarily took that fruit, ate it, and said, God, whatever you do to her, you got to do it to me too. That's what I think. Just like Jesus Christ voluntarily became sin for us so that he could save us and we could become the bride of Christ. That'll preach. Okay, as a young Christian, I was reading my Bible and got, came across 2 Chronicles chapter 4. And it says, Solomon made a great sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, and five cubits the height thereof, and a line of thirty cubits did compass it about. I read that, I set my Bible down on my bed, and I said, Lord, this is wrong. If it's ten cubits across, it's not thirty cubits around. Anybody that studies mathematics knows to find the circumference of a circle, it's diameter times pi, 3.14159265. I said, it should not be thirty cubits around, it should be thirty-one point, you know, four one five, six, nine cubits around. Why did he say 30 cubits around? I thought there was an error in the Bible and I was going to quit Christianity. And I read the passage and read it and read it and read it and said, wait a minute, wait, 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 I'm missing something here. Verse 5 says it was a hand breadth thick. That's a lot of brass, that thick. And the brim of it was like the work of the brim of a cup. There are two theories of how to solve this supposed contradiction. One theory says it was 10 cubits outside to outside, not counting the thickness of the brass. Now that'll work. If you take 10 cubits, elbow to fingertip, subtract two hand breadths, and calculate backwards, you'll get a value of pi for the inner circumference of 3.14159. It'll work fine. You can give it a try. The other theory is that it says it had a brim like a cup. The bowl went up and had a brim coming out. So it's 30 cubits around the bowl, but 10 cubits across brim to brim, counting the little lip sticking out like most cups are bent out just a little bit. Either theory would probably solve the problem. No, there are no contradictions. So First King says, Solomon made this molten sea that held 2,000 baths. A bath is about 8 gallons. Yet 2 Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. Well, was it 2,000 baths or 3,000 baths? By the way, 3,000 baths, 24,000 gallons, is a small to mid-sized swimming pool. Okay, It's the kind you put in your backyard. That's a 24,000-gallon pool. That's a lot of water or oil or whatever they're going to put in this thing. Well, 2 Chronicles says it held 3,000 baths. 1 Kings says it contained 2,000 baths. Is that a contradiction? No, it's not full. It's two-thirds full, okay? It could hold 3,000, but it's only got 2,000 in it. How many horses did Solomon have? This is a contradiction the atheists always bring up. First King says, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Second Chronicle says, Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Well, which is it? 40,000 or 4,000? Now, we sell on our website The Defender's Bible by Henry Morris. I love Henry Morris and The Defender's Bible. He's a good personal friend of mine and his son, John Morris, good friend of mine. Love what they're doing. In The Defender's Bible, he's got a footnote right here that says this is a copyist error. He says this number is given as 4,000 in Second Chronicles. This is best explained as a copyist error. Well, I read that and I wrote a letter to Henry Morris and said, Brother, I love you, I sell your Bible, but I'm going to have to put a disclaimer in the front page. You have a mistake, actually quite a few mistakes, in your footnotes. And so I have a one-page disclaimer that goes with our Defender's Bible that we sell. They've got a stack up in shipping if you want to read it. That says, uh, we love Henry Morris. He's got many good notes in here, but like anything, you've got to eat the meat and spit out the bones. He's wrong about this one. There is not a copyist error. Both of those verses are absolutely fine. Read them carefully. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. Does that tell me how many chariots he had? No. 
That, tell me how, that tells me how many horses he had for the chariots, right? For Second Chronicles. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Oh, now that's, that's different. Apparently he had stalls for the keep the horses and chariots, and he had other stalls just for the horses for the chariots. Well, if they had 40,000 stalls of horses for the chariots, and he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, they had 10 horses per stall. 10 horses per chariot, I'm sorry. Not a contradiction at all. King James got it exactly correct. 10 horses per chariot. They would never put one horse per chariot. I mean, one arrow takes out the whole tank. They had chariot teams, actually. NIV got it wrong. New American Standard got it right. I collect other Bible versions. I got a bunch of them here. Uh, <clears throat> New Revised Standard got it wrong. How many men did David kill? 700 or 7,000? Well, look at the passages carefully. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians. First Chronicles. David slew of the Syrians 7,000 men which fought in chariots. Well, which is it? 700 or 7,000? Read it carefully. Again, Henry Morris has a footnote here that says this is a copyist error. No, I'm sorry, Henry, it is not a copyist error. Both verses are fine. Look at them carefully. If he slew the men of 700 chariots, and he slew 7,000 men which fought in chariots, what does that mean? Ten men per chariot. They had ten men and ten horses. They had chariot teams. You go out, you fight for a while, you come back, you swap out. See, the chariot does not get tired. The men and horses get tired. And the chariot is your tank. You don't want to lose that thing. So somebody gets wounded, you know, hurt, bring them back, swap out. They had chariot teams. NIV got it wrong. He killed 700 of their charioteers and 7,000 of their charioteers. There's a clear contradiction. Most of the new Bible versions that I'm aware of have some real serious contradictions built in. I'm not aware of any in the King James. The Bible says in Genesis 10, These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues. So the languages are divided in chapter 10. But you read chapter 11, it says the whole earth was of one language. When I debated Farrell Till, who's the editor of an um, atheist magazine up in Illinois, he said, oh, the Bible's got a contradiction. Chapter 10 says the languages were divided up, and chapter 11 says the whole world's of one language. See, the Bible's wrong. Farrell, chapter 11 is recapping, like giving a headline. Suppose you saw the headlines in the paper, 10 children killed in school bus accident. Then you start reading the article, and it says, The bus was driving down Highway 12. You say, wait, I thought, I thought they had a wreck. Yeah, the headline is summarizing the story, and now they're going back and giving the details, okay? Chapter 10 summarizes the story, and chapter 11 is going through and giving some of the details. Not a contradiction. Here's another supposed contradiction. How many died in the plague? Numbers 25 says, Those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. When you read the story in 1 Corinthians, it says there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Well, which is it? Twenty-four thousand died in the plague, according to Numbers, or is it twenty-three thousand died in the plague? Well, again, read it carefully. No contradiction. How many died in the plague? Twenty-four thousand. How many died in one day? Twenty-three thousand. Well, a thousand died the next day from the same plague. It's not a contradiction at all. So we go through in our college class quite a few of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. If you think there are some, you can uh, contact our office on our, uh, um, during our radio program. We have all kinds of time. We can take an hour and a half question every day on question, supposed contradictions in the Bible or questions on creation or evolution. Another contradiction people often ask about is, isn't the word Easter in the King James Bible an error? Didn't they make a mistake here? Every other version of the Bible, and I've got a whole collection of them here on the table, they, they use the word Passover in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. Look up Acts 12, 4, and they say, after Passover. King James says, after Easter. Well, let's read the passage and see what the truth is, okay? Um, now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Is Easter a mistake? All the other versions say Passover right there. Well, let's go back and study the original Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Aaron, he said, this month, talking about April, is, shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. 
Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, in the tenth day of this month, take a lamb. April 10th, you pick out a lamb, keep it up for four days. On the fourth day, April 14th, you kill it and you eat it that night. That was the Passover when they were getting ready to go out of Egypt. Okay. And then you put the blood on the two side posts and on the, and the top of your door. It says, they shall eat the flesh that night, April 14th. Kill the lamb, put the blood on the door, eat the lamb that night. Verse 11. It's the Lord's Passover. Eat it in haste, have your shoes on, hold your staff in your hand. It's, Jews today still go through this, you know. Every year they go through the Passover celebration. Amazing to watch. We did this as a kid. Uh, my mom had us do this several times. We loved it, okay? Verse 14. This day shall be unto you a memorial. You shall keep it a feast. Verse 15. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Here's the sequence. Tenth day, pick out a lamb. Watch it for four days. Make sure no blemishes. Fourteenth day, kill it. That night is the Passover. The death angel passed over the children of Israel if they had the blood on the doorpost. Eat, the, eat it that night. For the next seven days, you're going to be traveling around, running from Pharaoh, and so you eat unleavened bread. They had their kneading troughs, put the bread in there, but no leaven, wrapped it up, put it on their shoulder, carried it around through the wilderness, and ate unleavened bread for seven days. That was the seven days of unleavened bread. And they still today do that to commemorate uh, the, with this, the great Passover. It reminds them, so for seven days, they eat unleavened bread. Verse 17, You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 18. In the first month, in the fourteenth day of the month at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Starting the fourteenth for the next seven days till the twenty-first, eat unleavened bread. Numbers chapter 28. The fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover. In the fifteenth day of the month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. So here's the sequence of events. The Passover was always at night on April the fourteenth. For the next seven days, they ate unleavened bread that always followed the Passover. Now, there was a pagan festival of Ishtar, or Ashtar, or today called Ishtar, is Easter. That was a pagan festival that always came near the end of April. And it was so many days after the first full moon, and they had all kinds of formulas to figure out when this day comes. And we still use the same formulas today to calculate when Easter is. But Easter was a pagan holiday to commemorate the earth regenerating itself. You know, things start to grow again. You got Easter lilies. And so that's why they have all kinds of regeneration symbolism in the, in the Easter holiday, Easter bunny, like Playboy bunny, okay? Re, uh, all stuff on fertility symbols, Easter rabbits, the Easter eggs. Those are all symbols of fertility, and it is definitely a pagan holiday. Now, is it something worth fighting and beating somebody up over? No, okay? Christ did rise from the dead, and if you want to celebrate that day, that's fine. People get carried away over these holidays and go around, you know, refuse to celebrate any holidays. I don't think you ought to do that. But you need to understand, Christmas and Easter both are pagan holidays, no question. That date, anyway, is. But I don't think it's nothing worth beating somebody up over. So, the feast days are never called Passover anywhere in Scripture. Peter was arrested during the days of unleavened bread. It says so very clearly in Acts 12, which means the Passover was already gone. Has to be. Herod wanted to kill him during his own pagan festival of Easter coming up in a few days. King James is the only version to get it right. Look at Acts 12 now, verse uh, 3. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivering to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. King James is the only one that got it right. And we'll cover more on that in a minute. The guy who invented the word Passover is William Tyndale. He made up that word, and he didn't use that word in Acts 12 and in his translation. And we cover more of that in our college class. How did King Saul die? This heretics will say, well, look, it's got a contradiction here in the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, it says, Saul took a sword and fell on it and killed himself. He committed suicide. He asked the armor bearer, hey, will you kill me? I'm wounded. The guy said, no, I'm scared. And so Saul killed himself. When you read chapter 2, the, this guy walks up to King David at the camp and says, Hey, here's Saul's crown and his jewelry. You know, I, I killed him. Because you know, he knew David and Saul were enemies. And the Amalekite said, uh, I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. Well, did he die by suicide or did he die by the Amalekite? There's no contradiction here. He died by suicide and this guy's lying. He's hoping to get a reward. Hey, David, I killed Saul. Ha ha, give me my reward, please. David's reward was, I'm going to cut off your head, son, okay? 
Uh, so there's all kinds of supposed contradictions in the Bible, and we cover a lot of these in our college classes, or if you can call into our radio program. We'll just cover a couple more because we could spend forever on supposed contradictions. There's a book called The Errors in the King James Bible by Peter Ruckman. It used to be called Problem Texts. It's basically the same book with a different cover on it. But in here, he covers 500 of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. We've got about 90 pages of uh, data on supposed contradictions in our a website uh, on our uh, downloadable section on articles about contradictions. Here's one I, atheists always get to me. They'll say, was Jonah swallowed by a whale or a fish? If you read Jonah chapter 1, it says, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and he was three days and three nights in the fish's belly. Okay? Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1, he was in the fish's belly. But when you read the story in Matthew chapter 12, it says, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And the atheist will say, aha, see, the Bible's wrong, a fish is not, a whale's not a fish, ha, ha, ha. Well, in our modern 21st century classification system, a whale is not a fish. But in the biblical classification system, a whale is a fish. If it swims in the water, it's a, a dolphin is a fish in biblical classification system. So you can't take, you know, Carolus Linnaeus's classification system in the last 200 years and superimpose that on the Bible and call the Bible wrong. No, it's a whale and a fish are the same thing in biblical classification. And we could talk about some of the little minor stuff. There's about 500 passages that people commonly say are mistakes in the Bible. And all of them are covered in Ruckman's book. He's a little rude, crude, and unnecessarily mean about it, but it's, he's right, okay? His logic is really good. This one, the atheists love coming up with this one. They'll say, well, do, do insects have four feet? And I say, no. Well, sort of, because I know where they're headed with that one. In Leviticus chapter 11, it says, these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing the locust, the beetle, the grasshopper, but other flying living things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. They'll say, see, insects have six legs. Everybody knows that. Moses must have been stupid or there's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, I'm sure Moses saw plenty of insects during his life and he knew about the six legs. Why did he say four feet? Well, insects do have six legs, according to our way of thinking. We have a model here of a giant, uh, this is a giant mosquito, okay? Somebody made for us out of copper pipe. And they say, see, it's got six legs. Well, sort of. Spiders, do they have eight legs? Well, we better be cautious here how we define this. If you look at the Bible carefully, you'll see in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, it says, the spider taketh hold with her hands. Could it be that four of them which point backwards are considered feet and the four that point forward are considered hands? Just because we consider them all eight legs doesn't mean the spider considers them eight legs. If a spider is going to do something like, you know, maneuver things around, it's going to use its hands. How about the uh, mosquito? Does he have six legs or four legs and two hands. Just because he happens to walk on all six of them doesn't mean they're all legs. I don't think there's a contradiction in the Bible.